about niche space. Another really important concept then is what we're going to term the, the abiotically suitable area. And what, what I've done here is represent that by these closed um, oval spaces um, here. These are the areas in the landscape that are actually suitable for the species. So if it could disperse there, or if there was no biotic competition, these are abiotically suitable. So I'm saying that within this area, for example, here, well, we don't have any occurrence records here, and the species isn't actually distributed there, it's not shaded grey, it's not part of the occupied distributional area. Um, but we're saying that the environment there, or the landscape there, is abiotically suitable. So the soil type is, is suitable, the precipitation regime is suitable, the temperature is within suitable bounds. And again, we can then plot that back into um, ecological space, and we're going to refer to that as, as the sinopoetic fundamental niche, or it, it really the sinopoetic existing fundamental niche, bit of a mouthful. It's set out in a lot more detail why we've gone for these kind of more um, elaborate terms um, in, in, in the book that we've just um, uh, put out there, the, the Princeton University Press book. Um, but what I want to simplify for that now is think of that really just as the fundamental niche. This is the part of the um, ecological space, the part of the niche space that is actually suitable for the species to occur. So notice again that there are areas of niche space that are not actually occupied, they're not actually part of the occupied niche space, but they are abiotically suitable, um, uh, but the species doesn't occur there. And if you think back to geography, okay, from space E here to space B here, that might be this kind of area that, well, is, the environment is suitable, but Suppose there's some big mountain range running through here, or there's a river or a stream that's restricted dispersal to this area. So the species doesn't actually occur there, but it's abiotically suitable. And that would then map back into environmental space onto this part of the fundamental niche, this unshaded shape, uh, part E here, that is, is suitable for the species, but it doesn't occur there. And similarly here, with this kind of area C, if you like, that. Maybe it's dispersal restriction, maybe the species is outcompeted here. If you think back to the, the, the couple of slides ago with the, the um, uh, realised versus fundamental niche, this might be an area that the species is outcompeted by a, a, you know, a, another species. Or it might be an area where there's not a, 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 a symbiotic species that the species relies on. It's not just about competition, it's about ecological networks and, and the complex interactions between the species. So we're going to talk an awful lot about geographic space versus environmental space and when we're working um, geographically on the map and when we're working ecologically um, in, in many cases when we're actually doing ecological niche modeling and I'm labouring the point because these are fundamental terms, these are really important points that we're going to come back to during the week and we, we, we really need to be all on the same page that this is our, our starting point. All right, so using exactly the same symbols and, and, and concepts, if you like, as on, on the last slide, but presenting things a little bit differently, this is again exactly the same geographic space, this is the same environmental space, but what are we actually trying to do then with the ecological niche models? Well, I've tried to represent that in this case with uh, this very thin black, um, uh, sorry, this very thick black outline compare that to the thin black outline that's used as on the last slide to define the abiotically suitable area or, or, or the fundamental niche. What we're trying to do with the niche models is go from geographic space, but in environmental space we're trying to characterise what that part of the niche space is that is actually occupied by the species, or, or more specifically, to more correctly really, it's that part of the niche space that we have occurrence records for. So supposing, again, this is just conceptually, and this is kind of supposing that we have a really, really good niche model that can actually define some sort of niche around the species. We would hope that our model characterizes the niche space that is occupied, or, or more specifically, that we have species occurrence records for. So this is 
When we talk about trying to use, say, MaxEnt or trying to use a genetic algorithm or some sort of statistical approach, a generalized linear model, machine learning approach, a, a boosted regression tree, these are all approaches that are trying to do the best job of characterizing this part of niche space. Now notice that we're not, we've got the same issue that we had on the, on the previous slide. We're only working with the species occurrence records here. That's all we know. That's the information that we have to work with. So the niche model isn't, in fact, in many cases, going to characterize the whole of the environmental space that the species occupies. So that would be this area here that's shown in light gray. It's also not going to show us the full extent of the fundamental niche. There are going to be many parts, potentially, of niche space that we don't have occurrence records for, and therefore they're not characterized by the ecological niche model. And different scenarios in terms of, of, of the different um, occurrence records and different situations, different types of organisms, different degrees of sampling that we have, you know, how many occurrence records do, do we have, how well is the ecological niche um, sampled by our occurrence records. These are all complications we'll talk about, but the fundamental point is that the niche model is just going to characterize those parts of environmental space that we have occurrence records for. Then what we do, we build the model in ecological space, almost always, there are some cool techniques that we're not really going to talk about this week, this week that start trying to incorporate geographical data in there as well. We're, we're, it's not really our focus. We, we, we think about ecological niche models as trying to characterize the, 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 the niche in uh, ecological niche space. Then what we do is, is project that back, it's another term you're going to use, this week, we're going to project that back into geographic space. So we're going to map onto the landscape all those areas that fall within the niche space that the model characterized. So, again, shown here by these black outlines, we're going to characterize these niche spaces here. Notice, of course, that we would hope that we would get out, and um, we'd be, if our model's any good, we're going to characterize this niche space that the species occupies or that we have occurrence records for, but we're also going to make predictions, um, other predictions into the landscape. So for example, we're going to predict here, potentially some areas that we didn't have occurrence records for, but where the species does actually occur. So we remember it was shaded light gray because we were saying it was part of the occupied distributional area. We're also potentially going to characterize some parts of the abiotic niche, or more specifically, the, um, the, the abiotically suitable area, some parts of that that are abiotically suitable but we don't have any occurrence records for because the species really doesn't actually occur there. So these are kind of three fundamentally different but related predictions that we would expect to get out of the niche model. And, and we've numbered them one, two, and three here. Areas that are, um, in, in effect, characterizing the, the, the occurrence records that we have, and we hope that we're able to do that, but also predicting areas where we don't have occurrence records and where we don't have occurrence records and the species really doesn't occur there. Now again, I'm trying to see an idea that we'll come back to particularly on Wednesday when we talk about model evaluation. This complicates how do we evaluate our models. How do we evaluate a model in an area where we're saying well, it's, it's suitable for the species but we don't have any occurrence records there. And even if we have absence records, we might go here and not find the species, but the model's doing a good job. The model's telling us that the, the environment is suitable there. That's all the model's trying to do. Okay, we're going to talk about why those models can be, be useful. But um, I'm just seeding the idea that we'll come back to that. So in that case, an, an absence record from that area isn't necessarily a good test of whether, model, whether the model is good or bad, because it doesn't tell us anything actually about whether the environment is suitable or not because an absence record doesn't actually tell us that that space, that space is abiotically suitable even though the species isn't actually there. So, are we predicting the niche or are we predicting the distribution? Well, I'm going to throw out there right now and again we're going to talk about it a lot more. Essentially what we're doing here, all we're doing is we're characterizing those areas in the landscape that have, that have environmental conditions that are similar to where we've already observed the species. 
Sometimes that's going to approximate the distribution. Sometimes that's going to approximate the fundamental niche of the species. But essentially, that's all the models are telling us. We characterize the ecological niche and we project that back into environmental space. It just tells us these are areas in the landscape that are similar to where we've already observed the species. Okay? But can that be useful? So I'm going to throw out. So here's a question for you. So, so, so this is a, a more easy, easy, easy one to answer. That we, we're going to hope, you know, a, a lot of those kind of range maps and, and, and town just showed from, you know, old field guides and that. And this is really where the field grew up in, in, in many ways, this, this, this area of research. We have a few occurrence records, but what you'll usually see in a field guide is, you yeah, know, this is the area where we think the species occurs. And, you know, you're often just kind of getting a pen out and drawing an area around the occurrence records that you have. Well, the ecological niche model should do a pretty good job of doing that um, as well. It should identify just those areas where we've known that, 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 um, that the species occurs. But we're going to get these other predictions out here as well. So, so can anybody start throwing out ideas? And I'm not going to, at the moment, just kind of, we're not going to go back and forth with the microphone and that. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of translate the ideas for now, if you like, to, to, to keep this moving. But what, what, what use might we have for this prediction too? Why might that be a useful prediction?